Good morning. Would you stand and join us, please? Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. Uh, did not go hunting yesterday, but I did see a deer on the side of the road, so, <laughs> so I guess that counts, right? Um, welcome. If you're a guest, there's a perforated section in the bulletin. If you just tear that out and drop it in the offering plate in the back, that is your, our, your gift to us. And then uh, today we're going to be reading from Psalm 66. Psalm 66, if you get your Bible out, Psalm 66. And the word of the Lord says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. 
All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name, Selah. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land, and they passed through the river on foot. There, there did we rejoice in him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. Just thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, and I just pray that you would uh, uh, get the glory from, from our worship, Lord. And help us to, uh, to glorify you in all that we do, Lord. Let's pray for Pastor Jamie as he brings the word today. Just uh, speak through him. Let it convict our hearts and help us apply it to our lives. And I say this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by
Good morning, if you would turn to Mark chapter 2, today will be in Mark chapter 2 verse 18 through chapter 3 verse 6. So I want you to look at a couple of different pictures here, everybody's favorite snakes. Yeah, these two snakes uh, are actually very similar in the way they look. Now, the top one is a scarlet king snake, okay? The bottom one is a coral snake, okay? The top one is basically harmless. In fact, it's helpful. It eats rodents and things like that. Uh, The bottom one, if it bites you and you have a bad reaction because it's venomous, it will kill you, okay? It's, It's a coral, but they look very... Very similar. And they inhabit actually the same areas, the southeastern United States. And the only real difference in them is their, is their color variation to tell them apart. And it's a very small variation, but some of you actually may have heard a rhyme to help tell it apart. And it's this, red touch yellow, kill a fellow. Look at the coral snake, the red touch is the yellow. Red touch black, safe for Jack or friend of Jack. So only re- they're very similar. You see them, you think one is the other. You have to know the subtle differences. To make things even more complicated, if you get bit by a king snake, you know, it's, you just wash the wound out. You don't really feel anything. You make sure it's disinfected. You're, you're fine. If you get bit by a coral snake, the problem with a coral snake is sometimes the uh, complications from being bitten by a cor- coral snake, unlike a rattlesnake or something like that, you may not feel the effects sometimes for 8 to 12 hours. So by the time you actually feel the effects of what's going on in your system, the venom has already started doing its work and has been doing its work for a while. And you're kind of behind the eight ball there. And you've got to get to the hospital to, you know, because the venom has already been in your system and has been working for hours. So it can be a very complex situation. Two things can look very alike and they can even have similar attributes but they can be very, very different and have different impacts on people. Now, this is true with what we call legalism. You may have heard the term legalism. I want to define that for you as we get started this morning because we're going to look at the difference between legalism and we're kind of going to focus on the characteristics of legalism. Basically, legalism is the coral snake, okay? We're going to focus on legalism, but we're going to also compare it in some ways to the gospel. What's the difference between legalism and the gospel? So in defining legalism... Legalism is the belief that one's actions and behavior or the person's adherence to certain laws and regulations is what gives them a right standing before God. It is, legalism is the belief that you are right before God based on your actions. And if you do enough good, if you do the right things, you win favor with God and you stand righteous before God. The other thing about legalism is it tends to focus on man-made rules, not God's rules. 
So it's not just that it gives you a false sense of security because you think you're right with God when in fact you're not. But the other part about legalism is it tends to focus on rules made by men, not by God. And so legalism puts a lot of requirements on people that God <clears throat> never puts on people. And this is what we call legalism. So it's important because like the king snake and the coral snake, they can look very similar. You even can find them in the same place, the church. You can find them, legalism and the gospel, in the same place, in the context of, of, of Christians. But they are very different. One, the gospel is helpful, even hopeful, and saves. And the other uh, can destroy. So if you'd please stand, I want to read Mark chapter 2, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 6. And there's three different encounters Jesus has with the Pharisees. And we'll see this legalism as we look at this text today. Beginning in Mark chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Now John's disciples... Referring here to John the Baptist, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to, to him, to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The day will come when they, the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment if he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. And one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and they made their way. As they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, and which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful in the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him and how to destroy him. You can be seated. So Jesus was consistently confronted with people, especially Pharisees, who we would call the legalists, who insisted that people follow traditional Jewish customs as necessary to achieve righteousness. Legalism has always been and always will be one of the main enemies of the gospel. The problem is it's very subtle. It's very difficult at times to identify. So what I want to do today is I want, you, I want to show you with these stories here four characteristics of legalism to look for, to make sure if you notice it, you see it, and, and probably more important, if you notice it in your own life, that you're able to identify when you have crossed over from gospel thinking to legalistic thinking. Let's begin with this. Legalism establishes arbitrary and shifting standards of righteousness. Legalism establishes arbitrary and shifting standards of righteousness. Look at verses 18 to 20 of chapter 2. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So these people who could have been from these two groups, John's disciples, and the Pharisees, or simply people who were observing everything, that maybe weren't a part of any particular group, they were just observing John's disciples and the Pharisees and, and Jesus' disciples, questioning them, saying, why are John's disciples fasting so much, and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Now, according to the Old Testament, fasting was only required one day a year on the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement. But by this time, Jews had begun to practice twice a week fasting. But those were man-made Regulations. They had come up with their own traditional views of fasting. So it was very common for people who were Jewish to be fasting more than certainly one time a year. They would fast a couple of times a week. But Jesus' disciples did not tend to make this a priority, and the people wanted to know why. 
So what Jesus does is he answers by pointing to himself as the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's the groom. The church is the bride. And he compares his being there, present among his disciples, to a wedding. And he says it's okay and appropriate for his disciples not to fast. He said at a wedding it would make no sense for people to stand around and fast at a wedding. Has anybody ever been to a wedding where people just, we're just going to get together after the wedding and we're going to have a reception, we're going to stand around but there's not going to be any food. No, there's food. Why? Because food is a part of the celebration of the wedding. And so Jesus said it doesn't make any sense why the bridegroom is here with the bride to be fasting. This is a time of celebrating. Then he says, though, that there will come a day when he will be snatched away. He will be taken away. It's in a, it, it's, the signal here is that it's an abrupt leaving. And in that time, it will be appropriate to fast. He said because fasting was a time, was something that people did to mourn. And in that time, there might be a mourning, especially as they watched and witnessed his crucifixion. But what he's saying they needed to do was they needed to quit comparing his disciples to other people and get to the truth of what was happening in the moment. Instead of looking at everybody around them and comparing everybody to everybody else, they needed to get the tr to the truth of who he was and what was going on at that time. But here's what had happened. These people had established in their own minds certain standards of righteousness. They may have even done it without realizing. They had established this standard in their head. Well, if John's disciples are fasting twice a week or more, and the Pharisees who are the religious leaders are fasting twice a week or more, and Jesus' disciples aren't, well, they can't be as religious. Something's going on here. They must not be as spiritual. But Jesus' followers are not breaking any moral law given by God. They were just not following expectations set by men. And actually, far from being inappropriate, Jesus tells them that them eating and not fasting as much while he's there was actually appropriate. So here's what legalism does. It compares person to person. It will always show how one group is is, or will try to show how one group is inherently more righteous than another using criteria that is based on human opinion, such as personal preference or cultural tradition, or traditions that even rose up in a religious environment, but you can't go back to Scripture and point to them as actually being a part of God's expectation. It always pits people against people by showing or trying to show how one is inherently better than the other. What it does not do but that it should do, and what the Bible does, is it, com it, it should compare all people to God because that levels the field. Right? Doing so reminds us, instead of comparing ourselves to somebody else or comparing groups of people, we should all be looking to Christ and compare ourselves to Him because that puts us on a level field because that's when we come to realize what Romans 3 says, and that's all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, one of the main issues with legalism is it robs from the glory of God. And the way it robs from the glory of God is it puts attention on people instead of God. We start looking to each other for standards of righteousness instead of looking to God for our standard of righteousness. And for legalists, these standards of righteousness are never quite set. They're always shifting depending on the moment or the people involved or traditions involved. Uh, and, and so the requirements are impossible to satisfy. Have you ever tried to play a game, especially with a small child, that kept changing the rules in the middle of the game? Especially a game if they invented it. Small children like to invent games, and they want you to play the game they invented. So you get the rules, and you start playing by their rules, and you start winning even by their rules. And then what happens? They change the rules on you. And you just realize, I'm not going to win this game. It's impossible because the guidelines and the rules keep shifting. That's what legalism does. Well, I, I acted in this way, and this was righteous to this group, but it, this group says it's not righteous. And I pleased this group, but I didn't please this group. And so there's no way to win in legalism. But God's word and God's standards are never shifting, and they are unchanging. James said in James chapter 117 that in God there is no variation or shadow due to change. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Legalism does not recognize God's word as the ultimate authority. It always recognizes something else as the ultimate authority, the culture or personal preference or the tradition that you grew up in. And it uses that for comparison instead of everybody going back to God's standard of righteousness, which is Christ and his word. So that's one characteristic of legalism. The second characteristic of legalism we see here is that legalism misrepresents, misuses, and or misapplies Scripture. It can do all of those. It misinterprets, misuses, and or misapplies Scripture. Now, we will see this in all three of these accounts. 
What I mean by misinterpretation of Scripture is that what you think the Scripture is saying is really not what it's saying. And any of these, by the way, can be done on purpose or even accidentally. All right? When I say the misuse of Scripture, it's basically using Scripture for that which was never intended for. And that usually involves misinterpretation as well. The misapplication of Scripture means that while the interpretation may have been correct, we use it, we apply it in our lives in a way it was never meant to be applied. And again, all these can be intentional or unintentional. So in the first account, Jesus says to those who confront him about the disciples not fasting, here was his reply, beginning in verse 21 and looking into verse 22. Jesus says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskin. So the old clothing here and the old wineskins represents the older traditional way of thinking, specifically the Old Testament. Now, it is correct if you follow all of the Old Testament law perfectly, you can go to heaven. Of course, we all know the problem with that. Nobody is going to follow all of God's expectations and law perfectly. All right? The problem is that nobody can do this. That's, that's why the law points us to Christ. If we're going to be saved and we can't be saved by how good we are, if we're going to be saved, there has to be another way. That points us to Jesus and salvation by grace. What Jesus is saying here is not that he had come to fix the law of the Old Testament or even rejuvenate it, but he said he had come to replace it, basically, or better yet, complete it. That's what he says in Matthew chapter 5. He came to not replace the law or or to say it was incorrect, but he came as the fulfillment. All right. So just as a new patch of old clothing is is incompatible with old clothing, because the old clothing's already shrunk. You put a new patch of material on old clothing, and then as the, as the new piece of cloth shrinks, it's going to tear away from the old clothing. If you put new wine in old wine skins that are cracked, and as the fermentation process things expand, they're just going to burst. He's basically saying you can't have salvation by works and salvation by grace. They don't fit together. You have to have one or the other. You can't get to God either by his unmerited favor, or you, in fact, earned your way. Either God grants you salvation out of grace, out of nothing you did, or he grants you salvation based on your merit. But you can't have both. Now, according to texts like Galatians 3, the law was not wrong, okay? The Old Testament's not wrong. It had not failed. But the law's purpose was never to grant salvation. The law's purpose was to show us We can never work our way to salvation. God lays out all these guidelines to humanity to basically show us, try all you want. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. And so we start to look for another way. So Jesus is saying the law had served its purpose here, and now he had come to finish the story. He had come to be the way that a person can be made right with God. So these people, knowing the Old Testament, here's what they had done. They're, they're, They're not thinking about the Old Testament correctly. They're misapplying misusing, they're misinterpreting scripture, they were still assuming the Old Testament laws and following the regulations of the Old Testament were the way to get to salvation. When Jesus was telling them they had misrepresented the purpose of the law, the purpose of the law was was never to save them, but was actually to reveal their guilt and to point them toward grace, which is what he was and who he represented. All right, so they had, they were, they were looking at the Old Testament, the Old Testament law in a way that was not designed to be looked at. Now look at verses 23 To 28. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he was hungry, and he and those with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar and the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, referring to himself, is Lord even over the Sabbath. So here the Pharisees misuse Scripture in at least three ways. First, they accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath by plucking heads of grain as they walked. Basically what they considered the the disciples doing as they were just walking along, plucking heads of grain, they considered that work. They considered it harvesting. Okay, That was absurd. All right, that was an absurd comparison. In fact, 
what they would do a lot of times in these grain fields is they would leave the corners of the fields still up so that as people traveled and they had need, they could actually go by and pick them. The disciples were not harvesting, okay? They were not working. They were walking, going to get a snack as they were walking. It's like leaving here today and going to get a gallon of milk because you don't have milk at the house and somebody saying, I can't believe you went grocery shopping on Sunday. You're not grocery shopping. You picked up a gallon of milk. Not that I'm against either on Sunday. But it, 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 it was a comparison that really should have never been made. All right. Then they apparently did not recall, as much as they claim to know about in the Bible, that when King David was in need and hungry, there was a time when he was given bread that was reserved for the priest because he was hungry and needy. And his people with him were hungry and needy. So there was an exception made to a ceremonial law to meet a real immediate need there. And then third, they forgot the purpose of the Sabbath, that it was to bless men, not put burdens on men. And they had reversed the role of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, as far as they were concerned, at light, the, Sabbath, uh, sir, was, the Sabbath is supposed to serve men, not vice versa. And they had reversed that role. So they had twisted Scripture, they had forgotten Scripture, and they had misapplied Scripture. And this is what legalism does. It will always use Scripture in a way that it was never meant to be used to prove, usually, a personal point that is not a true godly point. And what it often does is it overemphasizes some scripture while ignoring others. This is a hallmark of legalism. Somebody will call you out for not following a scripture, but conveniently forget a ton of other scriptures that apply to the moment. Now, this is why it's, first of all, under, important to understand scripture in context so you get it right, but also to have a solid view of the totality of the Bible. So you don't focus just on one part of Scripture, okay, at the, at the risk of ignoring other parts of the Bible. So be careful about using the Bible to make your point while overemphasizing, or overlooking, I'm sorry, other pertinent Scripture that may be inconvenient to your point, which we tend to do. We like to, we like to prove a point and, with Scripture, but overlook other Scripture, right? And here's how we do it. We do what's called proof texting. Proof texting is when you have an opinion, and then you find Scripture to back up your opinion. All right, Your opinion comes first, then you look for Scripture to back it up. I remember uh, one of my seminary professors humorously said one time, he was going to preach in chapel. We asked him, what are you preaching? He says, I know what I want to say, I just need to find some Scripture to back up my opinions. And he, was jo- he knew we would think that was terrible, and he was joking. He knew the topic he kind of wanted to deal with. He didn't just didn't know what Scripture he was, he was going to preach on. But that is what we do. We will hold an opinion. Okay, and then we will find scripture to back up our opinion. And and instead of backing up, putting our opinion to the side and and form a well-informed opinion on the on on that particular topic. All right, because we're very protective of our opinions. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. Everybody likes to be think they're right. Nobody likes to think we're wrong, especially about our our spiritual lives. And we could especially we could have been wrong for years and how we've thought about something. So we will we will protect our opinions by using scripture that prove our point. And if anybody comes to us with a different scripture to think differently, we get extremely offended. That is another sign of legalism. Right? Christians should never be offended when somebody asks them to look at scripture. I've never understood that. If I have an opinion about something and I give scripture to back up my point, you come to me and say, well, what about this scripture? My reaction should be, well, let me like, take a look at that. Let's see if that applies here. Let's see if it may reshape the way that I think. Peter warns us in 2 Peter chapter 3 that some scriptures are difficult, but they should not be twisted to meet our own agendas. And rightly divide the word of truth is what we're called to do in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. So we say what the Bible says in context, using the totality of the context of scripture, and what it says, it says. And where the truth falls is where the truth falls. But we are, the only thing we may be more protective of than our children or our families is our personal opinions on a topic especially if we hold it dear and we're passionate about it, especially if our parents taught us and this is how we grew up. I mean, we get, ve- we, we get real bent out of shape, all right? I mean, I've seen people get upset. Boy, you, you do something against their... We're all protective of our kids, right? You do something against your, the kids. Every parent, you know, is biased toward their children, all right? Uh, we're just as biased toward our opinions. Oh, you don't touch my opinion. You can do what you want with my kid, but leave my opinion alone. All right, I leave my opinions or these deeply held beliefs alone. <clears throat> a third characteristic of legalism is that legalism looks for reasons to condemn. It does not look for reasons to show compassion. 
It looks for reasons to condemn, not show compassion. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? They were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he restored it. And, and the man stretched it out, and, he, and his hand was restored. So here the Pharisees watched Jesus to see how he would react to a man with a withered hand. And in fact, the way it's written, it, it, it's possible they planted the man. Not that he didn't have a withered hand, but that somehow they got the man there, knowing that Jesus would come, just to see how Jesus would react to this situation. Because they believed, again, that Jesus healing the man on the Sabbath would constitute as working, as if... Anything Jesus did was hard work. I mean, he turned, you know, he fed thousands of people with a few loaves and fish. Jesus, this isn't work to Jesus. But they believed it was working. And again, the Pharisee had established all these kind of guidelines of what working would do. How many hours you could put in, what kind of work you could do. You know, they were defining what work was for everybody on the Sabbath. They didn't care about the man's physical condition. They only cared about condemning Jesus. So what Jesus does is he points out to them their lack of compassion. Their hypocrisy was was astounding here. Their only purpose and their only desire was to entrap Jesus in a way that would condemn him. While at the same time, they couldn't care less about this man who was crippled. And then on top of all this, they were ignoring the fact that they were sinning while trying to entrap Jesus and look for a way actually to kill him. You see, there is no compassion in legalism. No compassion. There's only condemnation. The urge to destroy overshadows any urge to show grace and mercy. Legalists do not get satisfaction from a sinner repenting. They only find satisfaction in a sinner being outed or condemned. They point out a sin not to help another person, but to help themselves or build their own reputation or self-confidence. Now, what's particularly disturbing about this element of legalism, and we see this very clearly in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, is that the legalist has a habit of pointing out the perceived sins of another person, which are defined by the legalist himself, while clearly ignoring the obvious blatant sins that they themselves are guilty of. So they are more than willing to point out in other people's lives things that they deem to be wrong, even though they don't have really any biblical support that it's wrong, but at the same time they conveniently, whether they're blinded by their own self-righteousness or they conveniently do it on purpose, they ignore the clear ways in their life that are wrong. That's another sign of a legalist. They'll tell you, you know, you shouldn't, and this is the only illustration I should come up with, so I may be opening a can of worms here, but you can't have a glass of wine at dinner you know, once every few months to celebrate something while they're driving around I-65 80 miles an hour. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll condemn you on something iffy, but they totally ignore what they're doing that's clearly wrong. And I'm not condoning glass of wine or driving around. I'm certainly not condoning driving around I-65 with a glass of wine at 80 miles an hour, all right? I'm just saying, be careful because we'll condemn things that are iffy or they're gray areas or there's different views in Christianity on certain things, you know, but you'll totally ignore the sin in your own life. Or I, a person should never get a tattoo while they're at home secretly viewing porn. You know, that's the legalist for you. They're, they're always out to condemn things in other people's lives that look similar, maybe iffy, but they themselves are totally ignoring the sin in their own life. The legalists cannot seem to get the plank out of their own eye, but for some reason have no problem seeing the speck in another person's eye, which is, of course, what Jesus warns against in Matthew 7. Now, part of our responsibility as believers is to lovingly confront sin. So I'm not trying to tell you you never have a right to point out sin in another person's life. We not only have that right, it's more of a responsibility and an obligation. But there's a difference person does it and a difference in, in, the, in the way the legalist does it. And let me just kind of summarize this for you. So if you're going to point out sin, here's a, it's kind of a summary of what the Bible says the way you should do it. First of all, it has to be a true sin. You have to be able to go to the Bible and say, this is a sin. Now it can be something obvious like sexual immorality, 
you know, losing your temper, or it could be something more subtle like pride, which is sometimes a little harder to identify, but at least you ought to be able to say, this is a sin, all right? It has to be out of love and concern for the other person that you do it. And perhaps, I would also add to this God's glory, a concern for God's glory. So the motive for pointing out the sin is love and concern for the other person and, and the name of Jesus, okay? Third, you can't be hypocritical in pointing out the sin. In other words, you can't do it and ignore your own sin, and you can't do it thinking you're not vulnerable. You can't go in to say, well, I'm going to confront this person in their sin. I would never do anything like what they've done. You can't go in with that kind of attitude. Fourth, you have to be willing to help them out of their sin. If you're going to confront somebody in their sin, you have to be willing to go to them and say, how can I help you? What can I do? How can I help you through this or through this struggle? That's how a godly person confronts sin in a person's life. Here's how the legalists confront sin. They do none of these things. They point out that which the Bible does not clearly define as sin. Okay? That they'll, they'll concentrate on something that's not clearly defined in the Bible as sin. They don't do it out of love or concern, but self-righteousness. They just want to be right. They ignore their own sin. And sometimes you're sitting there, I mean, thinking... Who in the world are you to confront me on an issue that's not even biblical when you know something that's going on in their life that's clearly wrong? And then they're never willing to help another person in sin. They just like to condemn them. They just like to tell people they're wrong. So there is the responsibility to confront sin in the church among ourselves. But how we do it, we need to do it as a person whose focus is the gospel and Christ and concern for the other person not like the legalist does it. The fourth characteristic of legalism I want you to see today is that legalism is motivated by a spirit of self-righteousness. Now, we've already seen a hint of this in all three of these accounts. Regarding fasting, it seems that the people implied that those who were fasting, as opposed to Jesus' disciples, were more spiritual. That's the implication of what they're saying. Is they're saying, These, they're fasting, your disciples aren't. They must be more spiritual than your disciples. So there's kind of a spirit of self-righteousness there. Regarding picking of the wheat, the implication is clearly that the Pharisees believed that their view of righteousness was superior and that they had, to, they had the right to judge Jesus' actions and his disciples. All right? And in the case of the man with the withered hand, the, the Pharisees very clearly were watching Jesus, which means they believed they had the right to judge him. So in every case, you have the spirit of self-righteousness where somebody sets themselves up as kind of the self-appointed judge of righteousness in the situation. All right, look at verse 6 of chapter 3. After Jesus heals this, withered, this man with the withered hand, it says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him and how to destroy him. So believing they had enough evidence to condemn Jesus, which they really didn't, they start to conspire against Jesus with the Herodians. That was a political group that was not particularly religious, their, their purpose was to keep King Herod in his position for political reasons. And if the Pharisees could make the Herodians believe that Jesus was a threat to Herod, then they would want him gone too. So they're conspiring. Normally the Pharisees and the Herodians did not get along. But now they had a common enemy. And the only thing that will bring two people together that don't get along is another <clears throat> common enemy. So the Pharisees clearly believe that they are in the right and that they know what is best and so they go and clearly do what is in the wrong and try to get rid of Jesus. They've set themselves up as the authority or the standard of righteousness in the situation. So legalism has this air about it, all right, which is sometimes it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but, but it's there. It has this air about it where the person believes they have this corner of morality, okay? They're never really willing to converse about the interpretation of Scripture, the application of Scripture, and, and see where they stand. They, they see things clearly, all right? And if, and if a person doesn't see things their way and look at Scripture the way they do, then they must be obviously wrong. That person's clearly not as spiritual. They often believe people should see, uh, they see themselves as the spiritual authority in the situation. And sometimes, if they deem themselves as the spiritual authority and the one who sees everything clearly in the situation, they will actually find a way to perhaps tear down, destroy, or get rid of the other person who they deem not as spiritual. And they see nothing wrong with it. Because after all, they have the corner on righteousness. They know what's right. They're, they're obviously interpreting Scripture 
the right way. Nobody can tell them they're not interpreting the Scripture the right way. And sometimes you even hear them say that what God has told me as if God speaks to them in a unique, different, more powerful way than he does anybody else. And this all points to an inflated sense of self-righteousness. But in these texts, what Jesus does is he gives us the proper sense of righteousness. Go back to chapter 2, verse 28. Jesus said, So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus sets himself up here as, as the standard of righteousness. So they're arguing about the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was a big deal in Jewish life. And here's what Jesus said. It's my Sabbath. I made it. I have the right to tell you what to do with it. I'm the one who instituted it. I'm the one that tells you how it can and can't be used. You have no right to question me or the people who follow me on what's going on the Sabbath. It's, it's like the president of a business writing a policy manual. You start a business, you write a policy manual for your employees. Your employees are standing around one day and say, hey, we've read this policy manual and we don't think you're following the policies to the president. We think it really means this, and we think you should be doing this, and we think this is how this applies. And the president says, that's never what I meant when I said that. That's not why I wrote this. Oh, but you're not right. Who are they to tell the president of the company who wrote the policy with his own intentions and purposes what he was thinking. He has the right to tell them what the policy really means, what he meant by that. These people had no right to question Jesus. Whether the Pharisees were willing to admit it or not, they were way out of their league by trying to lecture Jesus on anything regarding righteousness or the word of God or the proper application of God's word because there's only one standard of righteousness it's not them, it's Christ. He himself, through his spirit, wrote the word. There's only one judge of righteousness, that is Christ. So that's how we avoid legalism, is we go back to Jesus. We go back to him, we go back to his word, we go back to what he says. He's the standard. What he says about his word is the standard. How he says we should react to situations is the standard. Guarding against legalism does not mean that there are no standards of righteousness or that sin is, again, not necessary to confront. Legalism simply has a self serving view of sin and it has a misconstrued view of righteousness. And what legalism does, as we forget, is it denies that unrighteousness has already been confronted and it's already been taken care of. So Jesus in the gospel of grace is the answer to legalism. Here's why. Legalism says that some people are better than others naturally. Jesus says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Legalism says you have to prove your righteousness or earn it by your actions. The gospel says that all of your good works are like filthy rags. And it's an impossible task to please God with your actions. And that Christ alone is your righteousness. The only righteousness you can claim is the righteousness of Christ. Legalism says that sin is real, and you have to atone for it. You have to do something about it. The gospel says that sin is real, and Jesus has already atoned for it by dying on the cross. Legalism says you stand condemned. The gospel says there is no condemnation for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Legalism says you need to do right to be right. The gospel says Jesus makes you right, puts you in right standing before God, and then empowers you to live for him. That's the difference between legalism and the gospel. Now, I don't know if king snakes eat coral snakes. I do know king snakes eat other venomous snakes. But if that's the case, then the king snake swallows the coral snake. And the gospel swallows up that which is dangerous to the gospel. And the only cure for legalism is to get back to Jesus and grace and the gospel and then how to not just know that grace and put your faith in Christ, but how to live out of that grace. It doesn't mean you ignore sin. It doesn't mean all of a sudden all the standards are gone. It means that when it comes to confronting sin, we do it the way the Bible says we do it. It means when something is sin, we do it the way the Bible says or it's sin if the Bible says. It means if the Bible doesn't speak to it, we probably shouldn't speak to it. It means if the Bible says there's some room there for Christians to have some different views on some issues, we make room for each other to have some different views on some issues. 
All right? We let the Bible and Christ and his righteousness guide us. If you're here and you've never put your faith in Christ and you're trying to get there, you're a legalist. Okay, you're trying to convince yourself, if I just do enough good, if I do enough righteousness, God will be pleased with me. He will accept me. You're not only fighting a battle you can't win, you're further and further condemning yourself. Because you're calling God a liar. He says you can't earn your way or work toward him. You're saying, yes, I can. You're trying and trying harder and harder. And all you're doing is basically digging a deeper hole for yourself. Instead of giving up, having dug this hole for yourself for years and said, you know what, this doesn't work. I don't have any peace. I've never done enough. I can't please, I can't seem, I don't think I'm pleasing God. I'm not pleasing myself. I don't please anybody else around me. What do I do? And when you do that, you can finally look up out of your hole that you've dug for yourself and see Jesus standing there saying, all you have to do is put your faith in me. I'm your righteousness I accomplished everything on the cross that needed to be accomplished by paying your sin debt. The the law you couldn't keep, I kept. You get all the benefits of that. You get all the benefits of it if you simply put your faith in me. There's no need to keep trying harder. And I will change you, make you a new person, and then, yes, you will want to live for me, but I even do that for you because I put my spirit inside you to empower you to do that. That's grace. That's grace versus legalism. If you'd bow your heads... If you've never put your faith in Christ, if you're trying to work your way to God, stop it. Just stop it. For the sake of your own sanity, for the sake of your own soul, which is headed toward hell, if you keep trying that, there is no good you can do. Just trust that Jesus died on the cross, trust he was raised from the dead, believe he's accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished, and he's glad to give it to you freely. He doesn't even hold it over your head or make you feel guilty about it. He does this for you so you don't have to feel guilty. So there is no condemnation. So you don't feel like it's hanging over your head. He completely eradicates it from you and takes it from you. But you have to be willing to stop digging and you have to be willing to just say, I give up. And I'm done. And I'm going to trust that Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done. And if you have done that and you have put your faith in Christ, guard yourself from being a legalist. You are not the standard of righteousness for anybody else. You are not somebody else's standard of sanctification. The Holy Spirit speaks to them through his word, just like he speaks to you through his word. Your opinions are not scripture. You have no right to judge another person or condemn another person because they see something different from you that's not clearly defined in the Bible. And if you do see somebody in sin, your responsibility as a Christian is to care, to love them, to approach them in a loving way out of love for them and love for God and to help them, not just stand there and condemn them. We all can fall into this trap, and it's very easy to fall into. So we need to know that we need to know what it looks like. We need to know what the danger when we see it, even the subtle differences, and we need to guard ourselves against it. Lord, we thank you for Christ who is our righteousness, and we thank you for his word that guides us into righteousness through his spirit. Protect us from a legalistic mindset. Protect us from being self-righteous and feeling superior over other people. And Father, continue to convince us all that we are saved by grace and grace alone, only through what Christ has accomplished. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Would you stand and join us, please? Who, oh Lord, could save themselves, their own soul could heal? Our shame was deeper than the sea, your grace is deeper still.
bring your attention to a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we are still collecting medical supplies through this Thursday, if you look in your bulletin. If you have any questions about that, uh, you need to make sure you get the donations to Sammy Roycraft by this Thursday, November 19th. There's a list of things that are needed here just to help you out, uh, so we'd appreciate if you do that. We have met the goals for the cans of corn and the green beans, uh, as you will see, but we are still collecting it, so if you haven't done that, bring that, and the reason is that's what they want uh, for their Christmas outreach, but they have a food pantry there as well, so all this food will continue to be used <clears throat> by those in need. So we're going to keep collecting that uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. I want to just give a few words uh, of instruction uh, concerning the Thanksgiving dinner. First of all, if you are a guest today uh, and you weren't planning on staying for lunch, by all means do so. We always have plenty of food. Uh, don't forget you can fill out that guest registration form and drop that in an offering plate in the back of where you're sitting uh, so we can have a record of your visit. But we would love for you to stay for this. Uh, we would certainly uh, be glad to have you uh, as, our, as our guest. Here's how it's going to work. You're going to go to Sunday school. When you finish Sunday school, try not to mingle too much. Go ahead and make your way to the gym and go ahead and find a table to sit down. The tables are going to be set up no more than six to a table. They're spread out. We're trying to do this in the same way that restaurants are doing things uh, in order uh, to be safe and to follow uh, guidelines, okay? So go ahead and sit at the table, uh, and you'll be dismissed by tables. Now, because some of the numbers are going up as far as the COVID cases, if, if for some reason you signed up and you don't feel comfortable staying, that's fine. The first thing we're going to do, actually, is if you want to get your food and go home because you don't feel comfortable staying, then we've got to-go boxes available. So you'll be able to get your food into go box, and you can take it home and eat it or take it to a family member if you'd like to do that. We're more than happy to do that for you. The rest of you find a table, sit down, no more than six to a table, and you will be dismissed uh, by table when it's time to eat, okay? And you'll go through the line. You'll be served as you were during the picnic this summer, and you'll go back, and there'll always be somebody standing up there to serve food. So if you want seconds, come back, get a new plate, uh, get, get seconds and things of that, of that nature. Uh, so I think that's it as far as the instructions right now. When we get there, we will have the blessing before we eat. But when you break up from Sunday school, if you'd go ahead and head down that way and go ahead and just find a table and sit down, uh, that will really help us out, and we'll provide other instructions from there. Uh, but please, please stay. There's plenty of food, plenty of uh, room. Uh, I feel sorry for those of you who are sitting in the gym right now and can hear this because they've been smelling the food the whole morning, and they can't get into it 
uh, yet, although Randy, I think, was sneaking in the kitchen. Um, so anyway, but let's, uh, let's pray together uh, as we close today, and um, I will see you in a little bit uh, at, uh, at the meal. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your righteousness that you have so graciously given to us through Christ. Thank you for transforming us. Uh, thank you that we are saved by grace uh, through faith in Christ alone. And we not only cannot uh, work our way to you, we don't even have to worry about it. We can simply enjoy the grace you have given us and then live a life that says thank you for what you have done for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.